So I quite love Rust too. Um, the, the problem with Rust is that it's quite a complex language. So the syntax is quite complex and it has a lot of uh, nuance to different things of how you're doing things. And you always argue with the compiler. Uh, so there are some little quirks that kind of make you a little bit annoyed. And depending on the task, like if you really need to do something quick, quickly, and it's something that doesn't involve like a high, like top level performance, then Rust usually is not the best choice uh, because the, there are some additional things that you have to think about and that you have to do. Um, so if you're planning kind of a long-term project for multiple years for multiple developers and you're gonna maintain it for, you know, for a long time, then uh, and you do require this kind of a high level of performance, then it might be worth the extra costs but most of the time um, it's not. So for myself, I, I know that um, I try not to use it if I don't have to. <laughs> and then if I have to, I use it and I enjoy it. But it, it is, as I'm saying, like you're not as productive, for example, as in Golang. So in Golang, you can do things really quickly. Uh, and they are, the, some of the intuitions and some of the structures are so simple that it, it kind of, you, you're very productive. Uh, in Rust, you are also productive, but you need to take care of the memory management yourself. And that is an extra thing, right? So, okay. Uh, and also um, languages are kind of designed by people, of course, right? So different people have different attitudes towards the language when they are designing it. Uh, and you, you feel some languages are designed by one person and some languages are not designed by one person. <laughs> Same as like with series, right, on Netflix. Like sometimes you have a really good series and you know, there was like a brilliant director. There was like brilliant guy who came up with this idea and it's like brilliant, right? And some series are like, you know, they are designed by committee. Like it's like a bit inconsistent. You have those kind of storylines a little bit like endings somewhere, nowhere. And you know, yeah, that there was no one creative mind behind it, right? So with programming languages, it's the same. So some languages are like, you really feel there's just one guy or like two guys who came up with the language. Uh, with Rust, you have the feeling it's not the one guy, <laughs> okay? So C++, for example, used to be this one guy language. Uh, it was quite um, simple in a sense. Same with C, like C is like an example of a, of a very small, compact, concise language. And, you know, the book for C is very thin and you can understand all the principles and everything works the same way, like it's very consistent. And then C++, the, the very, very old C++ was kind of the same. Uh, it was more complex, of course, it, the book was, you know, much bigger, but it was kind of the same. And now C++ is really a complex beast. It's like, it's really like a single person to understand everything about the language is almost impossible. Like it's so complex, right? Um, and with Golang, they try to make this simplicity again. So with Golang, you have a feeling that the language, yes, it is limited in some areas, but you have the sense that the language is kind of a compact, uh, you know, small. With Rust, you don't have that sense. You, you have the sense that the language is like really, really big and really, really complex. Uh, so um, how do I move the slides here without the controller? Let me see. So I need. Um, all right, so I don't know how to how this is gonna work. I may need to be changing from place to place. Yeah, let's do that. All right, so. First question. Um, Jesus. All right. So yeah, of course you can. Um, uh, there are already some questions, but let's let do the quiz first. So um, you know a couple of languages already, and um, the first question is. Out of the languages that are in the, uh, yeah, so I start the quiz. Let's 
So we have CC++, Golang, Rust, and Haskell. How many keywords for a for loop you have in a language, right? So which one is, which language has the most? <laughs> oh yeah, I kind of gave up, uh, you know, um, given up the answer. Uh, so Rust has a really large number of for loop keywords. Um, so it has all the, the same as C++ and it has the while true keyword, which is called loop. Um, so why why do they did that right like in Golang you just have one you have one keyword which goes for while which goes for for which goes for for you know uh, iterators everything is done with a single keyword uh, and in Rust they said no it's good to have you know five keywords and it's great like uh, you just learn five instead of just one right um, all right so uh, one more um, one more question. So write all the keywords that you that you know for different programming languages. So what what loop keywords do you know from your programming languages that you know, already know? Yeah, map is kind of it's not really uh, like like it is in a sense. Yeah, you could you could call it. So if if we count map as a as a loop like construct, then Haskell has one, right? Because you have map mapping in Haskell. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. I didn't thought about that. Yeah. So map and filter are good examples of kind of a functional. Uh, take on looping. Um, yeah, so we have uh, looping for, through the range. You, we have looping through the some iterators. We have unconditional looping. We have conditional looping. We have, um, uh, you know, go to statements in some languages, which is a form of a loop. Um, but, you know, all your answers have a keyword for, right? So for is the most common keyword for a construct which kind of iterates over something, which, which loops. And in Golang, yes, they decided, yeah, that's all you need. You just need to remember that for is for loops. And then depending how you use it, it, it you have a different behavior, right? So if you just say for, it's like a loop in, in, um, in Rust. So Rust has a, a loop construct which is basically like four with nothing in it. Um, and then it's like while true, right? So instead of saying while true, you, you say loop. Um, and, you know, and, and then you kind of ask yourself, why, why do you really need that, right? Why can't you just say while, while true, right? And just have one keyword less, right? So when, when you learn Rust, you like, I felt that they introduce a lot of complexity unnecessarily because it doesn't really give you much more powerful language. It's just there. And then you need to remember about it, right? Um, so maybe there are some rationale of, of certain choices, but um, I'm not sure. So anyway, uh, I like Rust. I, I kind of like um, programming in it. Uh, and you do, every time you do need to have full control over memory and you want a very small footprint, uh, then you have the, the benefits, right? So one, um, one benefit is, let me unroll this. Uh, one huge benefit is that it's statically typed and you have no garbage collector, right? And what it means is that your runtime system is very simple because it doesn't need to do anything like you doing everything. So you doing all the memory management. Uh, so because of that, when you compile your executable, you don't carry over a runtime system, right? So a runtime system for garbage collected languages, they have to have the garbage collector. They have to have additional machinery to work with the runtime system to manage the memory. And here you don't have it. So for example, for embedded systems or for mobile systems, if you really want small footprint, that's great, right? It's better than Golang or you know, Haskell, right? Haskell has this huge runtime system for keeping track of everything and organizing the 
the lists and the memory for you and keeping track of all the function calls and so on, right? So the runtime system is very bulky. So if you want some small program, then you have to carry all this bulk with you, right? Um, whereas here you have this kind of um, uh, benefits of not having all, all that built in. And then um, it is quite interesting and quite unique because it has kind of a compile time memory management, right? It's like the concept which we didn't really have before. We had some tooling, for example, for C++, which tells you, oh yeah, you might have some dangling pointers. Um, so that there were kind of assisting tools in IDE and so on, which were kind of telling you that you might be doing something wrong with your memory, with your, with your pointers, uh, but it was not enforced by the compiler. Here, um, this kind of those checks, those um, static, code analysis checks are done by the compiler itself. And some people say, you know, eventually C++ will have it the same, like you, you know, you can do some analysis on the C++ code the same way as Rust is doing it. And the, 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 those two languages will kind of converge because they fill in the same niche, right? So C++ and Rust, they are both manually memory managed languages and, and so on. It's just that C++ is a little bit less secure in a sense that those checks are not done by the compiler, right? So here, if you're trying to do something with memory that is a little bit, uh, that, that, that is not sound, then uh, the compiler will complain and the compiler complains a lot, right? So it prevents you to do certain things with the memory and it keeps track of who allocated things and who will release the things such that you don't end up with uh, memory leaks or with some um, uh, concurrency problems when you're accessing the same uh, memory location, right? So it, it is kind of interesting, but that requires teaching yourself about the ownership and about, you know, passing the references and passing the, uh, like who owns particular piece of memory. And that's what makes the language kind of complex, but it also makes the language kind of strong because you, uh, the compiler prevents you making some memory bugs that, for example, C++ doesn't uh, prevent you to do, right? Um, you may ask, okay, but we do have managed pointers in C++, you know, 17 and 21. Can we just use that and that's safe? Like, you know, the pointers get released when, when we need them to be released. And the answer is yes, to some extent that's true, right? So a modern C++ with tooling and with all the uh, support that you have uh, is probably similarly safe to, to Rust. It's just that here, a lot of more safety is kind of built in by default. So some of the checks, some of the range checks and so on, the compiler will do that, right? So that the, uh, as I said, it, it's not part of the C++ compiler, it's, plus, it's a part of the tooling. Um, whereas here you ha have it sort of given. Um, the other thing is that here you have a little bit of a language uh, constructs which help you to manage that, right? In C++, you don't have that, that machinery. Um, and then it's very similar to other languages that you know, like it's similar to Golang in a sense that you have um, no inheritance, you're building your object-oriented kind of patterns by doing uh, structs and having methods on the structs. Um, it has... Um, build in immutability. So everything you kind of declare is immutable. And then if you need to mutate something, you have to specifically say mute uh, to be able to mutate variables, right? So it has a lot of kind of um, nice features kind of by default, whereas for example, in C++, you have to take care of it yourself, right? Um, what else it has? Um, so the, the basic types are kind of the same as um, with, other languages. So it ha has a normal primitive value types. Um, it has tuples, which is nice uh, because it's like a first class citizen in the language. So it's nice to be able to pass tuples around. Of course, it has structs. It has a fixed size arrays um, as most languages. Um, and the arrays are like, you cannot change the size of the array. So once the array is allocated, that's it. Uh, and then it has slices as well. So the concept of a slice from uh, Golang is similar to a concept of a slice here. So in terms of types, you already have 
understanding of all of that, right? You, you know how all of that works because it, it is kind of the same as with the other languages. It's just that the syntax is a little bit different. Um, a nice thing uh, that, uh, a nice thing that um, Rust has, yeah, so, so the basic types um, for integers, you say I and you say how big the integer is. So you can go from byte, which is I8, and then all the way to a very long register integers, like uh, 128 um, bits registers, uh, integers. Uh, and then you have signed or unsigned. If you say U, it means unsigned. If you say I, it's signed. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, with floats, again, you have the normal precision and double precision floats, so 32 bits or 64 bits. Then you have the normal bool, bools, uh, as with any other languages. And then with strings, it's a little bit complicated. Um, again, this complication, you already see it, like with the numbers and with bools, no problem. Those are just bits, right? Uh, uh, primitive value types. But with strings, well, what is a string, right? So Either it's an object which has a certain size and certain uh, properties and you can do certain things with it, or it's a string literal, right? And those are two different things because string literals, so like if we, when we have a program, where are the string literals stored? So you have the, you know, um, the heap allocated memory and you have kind of the, uh, the stack, which is uh, when the program stores all the symbols and all the uh, all the code and so on, right? So then your string can be either on the heap or it can be part of the you know read-only uh, allocated memory for your program, right? So if I have a string literal that sits in this kind of a read-only space, right? Uh, if I have a string as an object and it sits on the heap. That's a different thing, right? I can do different things with those two strings and it's kind of really different concept. And that's why in like in Golang or in Haskell, we don't care. It's the runtime system business. Like as we as a programmers, we just say string and you know, it, it, either it's a string literal or it's a string. We don't care. Then runtime system knows and runtime system keeps track of it, right? Here, you keep track of it, right? So you are in charge of managing that, like, sorry, right? So that's already, uh, you know, complicates your life a little bit. Uh, so you have to think, okay, is it a string literal? Did I type, you know, in quotes, my string, or is it something being constructed by con concatenating something or whatever? It's a runtime thing, or is it like, uh, you know, string literal? Um, so you already have to take care of that, right? In Golang or in Haskell, you don't care. Um, all right, so that's um, that's the normal types. Then we have tuples. Uh, tuples are quite simple, same as with um, same as as with Haskell. Uh, it's it's actually painful that Golang doesn't have tuples. So it sort of allows you to return two or three things from the function call that looks like a tuple, right? So when you say return something comma error, it kind of looks like a tuple, but it's not really a tuple. It, it doesn't have a tuple as a first class citizen, right? Um, so here it's quite nice that you have proper tuples. And then you, you specify, um, yeah, you have comma separated uh, slots and they can be of different type. So we have integer as a first element and kind of the string literal as a second one here. And then we have an empty tuple, right? So the just round brackets, like in Haskell, it's just a, Null tuple, right? Not containing nothing. So that's that's pretty nice and uh, simple. And then with arrays, again, most things are, are fine. So um, arrays are fixed size, and you can initialize them by giving the array literal, right? And they do use this notation with square brackets. Most programming languages use square brackets for arrays. But in Haskell, those are lists, so that's why I get kind of uh, confused often. <laughs> I, I'm, call, I'm calling the, the lists uh, arrays or arrays lists, but they kind of are exactly the same as, um, as Haskell lists, it's just that they are fixed length and they have to have the same type uh, across all the slots, right? Um, and then in line three, 
you, you see a declaration which, is, which says, we're gonna have an array of integers, like a 32-bit integers, and there'll be 10 of them, right? So we say, what is the type and what is the, um, what is the size? So um, in, in Golang, uh, you specify the size inside the square brackets, and then you have the type of what is inside the, the array kind of outside. So you say array of ints or array of strings, right? Um, here, um, most of the types are like this. You, you use um, double dot notation and you say the type behind your variable or behind uh, something. Uh, but for arrays, it's kind of inside and both the size and the type are kind of inside the square brackets. Um, I have to say, I kind of like the go go typing kind of uh, syntax a little bit more. It's more consistent. Here you have to remember what goes before sometimes, like you have some things that go before, like for example, struct, you say like in C, C++, you say struct name and then brackets. Um, sometimes it's behind and sometimes in, in, in the middle, right? So in, in arrays, it's in the middle. And then you can, um, when you declare it, it's not initialized, right? So your array is not initialized. And then you need to initialize it. Like you need to fill it up. You, you have to give it some sort of memory that it will hold. Um, and uh, those are two example ways of doing it. So you basically initialize it with the default, um, default values, which for integer will be zero. So this line, um, the, uh, the fourth line will basically initialize a new array of size 10 with integers and all of them will be zero. But um, it's the same as saying the second, uh, the second line, uh, the, the fifth line. So here um, there is a, um, a variable X, which is an array of integers and it is of, um, of size 10 and or it has been initialized with zeros. So you can either put type as the first argument or you can put the what you want to fill that in, right? Um, there are other ways of initializing it uh, and you and um, yeah, because you're kind of managing the memory yourself that there are multiple ways of how you can achieve that and how you can achieve a par particular behavior. Uh, but those are kind of our two most common, I guess. And of course you can initialize the array by the array literal as well. So like the second line is a simple list uh, array literal, which has three elements and those are kind of integers, right? Um, one interesting thing about literals, uh, let me see if I have the, so where is my, come on. So of course we're gonna use the uh, the Rust book, and the Rust book is nice because you have the uh, ability to run the example code inside the browser. So I was playing around um, before the class, and yeah, let's delete that. I was playing around with options. So if I say um, uh, I have I have this X, um, yeah, yeah. So I already have X here, right? So that's another feature of the language. So I can have a variable and this variable is mutable, but it's a option. Option is like a maybe type in, uh, in Haskell, right? So you, uh, I will talk a little bit about it in a minute, uh, but I can shadow this variable and have a new variable, which is uh, like having completely different definition, right? So it's not, um, yeah, they call it the shadowing. So it's kind of uh, similar to uh, some languages have that, that you can have a particular variable defined somewhere and then you kind of define the same name and it becomes a new variable and the old one, you can use it on the right hand side of the assignment and you can kind of a copy or trans transform it to something else, right? So in here, I could define X as something else, like it's as, as some type and have, if I use X here, this X is the previous one. And from this line on, 
x becomes this new type, right? The, the new variable, right? Uh, so you can use it for, for example, if you got a line of text and you're processing it, you can kind of oh, shadow it, shadow it, shadow it. And at the end, you have the same line of text, but it has been processed, right? Um, again, I'm not so sure that that's that great uh, because I kind of like if you don't have shadowing and if you have to redefine the name, because then I have like, let's say I'm, I'm processing some line of text and I got, so I got the text here, right? And it's called line. And then I'm doing something with, with this line. And somewhere down here, I have line, right? And then when I'm scanning the code and I'm reading the code and I, I see line, I actually don't know like what it is, uh, right? Because it could have been processed and now it could be a number, right? Let's say this, this was here a string, right? Uh, and then here, mentally, it is kind of, you know, you're supposed to keep it the same thing, like that it is the same thing, but I don't know, right? So in, in languages where shadowing is not allowed, then what would happen is I, you would have like, for example, you would call it uh, line trimmed and then uh, let line as number, right? And then here uh, I would have line as number. And then I, I, I know immediately what it is, like in, in what processing stage I am here, right? Uh, it's much easier for me mentally to keep track of what is where. Right, so they they have this kind of shadowing, but I kind of don't like it. So uh, I typically don't use it, but I know it is possible and, and it is kind of idiomatic way of, of using Rust. Uh, anyway, so you have this shadowing. So let, if we go back to our arrays. So if I say, um, um, yeah, so I wanted to initialize a new array. So let's say we have array of integers again. Um, but let's say I don't specify, specify the type. And then I say, okay, give me an array of zeros. Uh, give me 10 of them, right? So now I have X and X is an array of, um, of zeros. What, what is the type of this array? Is it a, like if, if I were to specify the type to guess the type, what is the type? I know the size is 10, but what is the type? Huh? No, it, it, uh, zero. So what is zero? Yeah, so you could say I32, but why not I8, right? It's a little bit arbitrary, right? Uh, so this, this thing is I32 by default, right? And only I32. Um, and then if you want floats, uh, you, you have to say this, right? So the numbers, um, uh, the numbers are not uh, polymorphic, right? So in Haskell numbers, the number literals are polymorphic. You can use them as different types depending on the context. Here, they are not. So um, integers are integers. And then if you want to say um, that something is a float, then you have to use the 0.0, .0 uh, kind of a float, floating point notation because the compiler will complain that you are kind of a, a trying to assign something that is not of that type, right? Um, so you don't, you, um, if you got used to the, the nice property of Haskell that the literals of numbers are polymorphic and val, va, value types are polymorphic, here you don't have it, right? Um, all right, so what else? Uh, let me see. Come on. Yeah, so structs. Structs are kind of simple. Uh, same as with um, uh, same as with Go, uh, but the, the notation is a little bit different. So you basically say, uh, where do we have this? Um, so you say, uh, I have a struct uh, XXX, and then you define what your fields are, right? And then you, you specify, let's say you specify a name and you say it's, uh, it's a string literal and I have an age and that's I32, right? Um, 
So you have um, the name, you have the, the, the struct, the name, and then the, the fields. Um, and then once you do that, uh, you can do that. Um, uh, and then you have a keyword. Um, like if you do that, then it's visible like within the particular namespace that, that, that you have it. And then you can make it public. So you say pop in front of it. Um, and once you have this type, you can make implementation of methods for it, right? But let's let's don't go too fast. Let's do the functions first. So uh, functions. Functions are um, um, quite nice. Um, you have a very simple um, syntax again. Uh, let me see. So with functions, you, you basically say um, fn, which starts a definition of a function. Then you have kind of a name. Then you have the list of parameters. So I can have parameter a, which is i32, and b, which is i32. And then you specify what is the return type. And you know it could be a tuple. So if it is a tuple, you specify it with comma-separated types of what it is. Uh, if it is a single thing, you can say, okay, it's I32, and then you have the body, right? So the functions are quite uh, like same as Golang. Um, uh, you notice that the type goes after the variables, uh, but you use this uh, colon thing, right? Um, so again, a small, uh, small inconsistency. So when you specify a type of a variable, you use the colon. Um, but if you're specifying the type for the return, you use the arrow, right? Uh, why don't you use the colon? I don't know. Uh, so you use the arrow, right? Um, and uh, you, of course, you can say return. So if I, if I do this, it would work fine. Um, but there is kind of, a, again, a bit of a twist in the language. You have semicolons, right? So. Uh, if I say I have a variable here, let x equal 10, and then I have to put a semicolon, right? If I don't put a semicolon here, it's a compiler error. Um, again, you know, it's 2021. You're asking why the hell do I need those semicolons, right? I mean, we just happily programmed for half a semester in Golang and Haskell without had semicolons, and suddenly, like, what the hell, right? Yeah, sorry, you have to use semicolons. And it's even more... <laughs> Uh, funny because you have certain things without semicolons. So for example, I could do this, right? And then that becomes an expression. So things that don't have semicolon often in Rust are expressions and they evaluate to a value, right? And then uh, because this function needs to evaluate to a value, which is integer, uh, then the last line evaluating to a value is the return type of that return value of that function, which is the, the stuff that we return, right? So actually this is kind of um, nice because you don't need this return keyword and you don't need the semicolon, right? Uh, why do you need the semicolon here? I don't know. Uh, people pro probably programming the parser were a bit uh, naive and couldn't work out how to do it without semicolons. Uh, so they have it, right? Um, yeah, it annoys me like to, to be doing those semicolons thing. And also it annoys me that they have this very clear distinction between statements and expressions, right? Uh, because it would have been so much nicer if everything was an expression such that you could mi mingle the, the various uh, statements that you have in Rust into more complex expressions, right? Uh, so, you know, we, we discussed it at the beginning of the semester that in languages that have a very, very powerful literals and very powerful expressions that you get, you get a lot of power as a programmer because then you decide how you combine those things, right? So we've seen in Haskell that you can have a language where you have very nice polymorphic literals uh, and, you know, you can express uh, in text a lot of stuff. Uh, same with JavaScript. JavaScript is, is quite popular because it has a very powerful uh, literal mechanic, right? Um, and then same with expressions. Like JavaScript, for example, is a very expressive in a sense of expressions. 
um, you don't you 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 can kind of uh, assign a lot of things to to other things. Uh, in Rust, you can sort of do that, but not quite. It's not as powerful. Uh, so remember, like things that don't have um, semicolon often are expressions that you can assign value to. So one of the expressions is if statement, right? Which is in in uh, in Rust it, both. It could be used as a statement, as a control flow. So I could say if I don't know a is bigger than x, then do something else. Do something else, right? Uh, so I can have uh, if statement used like this, and then it will basically do this block or this block depending on you know on the condition, or I could say let um, y equals and then if statement as an expression and then whatever is here, right? So if I say thirty or b, right? I will basically assign uh, to y a value of 30 or a value of B, which are both uh, integer I32, depending on the condition, right? So it is kind of nice to be able to use um, if statement as an expression. In a lot of languages, you can't do that. Like um, in Golang, you can't really do that, right? Uh, and if statement is a kind of a, just a statement, but here it, it is an expression as well. Um, so you can, you can do this. Uh, what else about the functions? Um, oh yeah, so closures. Okay, so um, remember in Golang, we could do this. We could say, I have a func which is my name, uh, whatever whatever that is. Oh, oops. And inside. I have a func which is uh, like inner and it does something. Oh, come on. It does something. And then I could say, and by the way, I can assign M um, type. Why you don't want to type? And M is my new function, right? I could do that, right? Uh, and the, the syntax where we use the func function declaration and function declaration is exactly the same, uh, same mechanic. And then the, the assignment is the same, right? Like uh, I can assign a function to, to a particular name. Then I can delete this name, right? And then it's, again, it's very consistent. It's always the same. I just have an anonymous function, right? So bearing that in mind, um, I have a quiz and I have a couple of questions about closures. So I will test you how you remember. We, we had closures at the very beginning uh, and we had closures for Golang because they were useful for some web, web framework. So closures and anonymous functions are the same thing. True or false? I know uh, it depends. It's kind of a good answer to do, right? I always told you the um, consultants are always saying it depends. Well, it's tempting to say it depends, but um, if you think idiomatically about what closures are and what anonymous functions are, they are not the same thing, right? Uh, idiomatically, they are not the same thing. Okay, so it's false. It doesn't depend. All right, next question. Did I start the question? No, did. Okay, that, that one is easy. So is anonymous function a function without a name? False, true, again, it depends. Use the idiomatic answer. It's true, very good, it is. Uh, so anonymous function is just like a function, just doesn't have a name, right? Very simple concept. So that's what anonymous functions are. And we do have them in many languages. Um, in 
C++, they are called lambdas. They don't call them anonymous functions, they call them lambdas, okay? Uh, in Java, you call them anonymous functions. Uh, you can even have anonymous classes, right? Um, although in, in Java, they also call them lambdas. Uh, they call anonymous classes and lambdas, okay? Sorry? In Haskell, they, you call them lambdas too, yeah. Um, that, that's true. And you actually use this sort of lambda-like symbol for them, right? Yeah, very good. All right, so next question. We, we're getting there to the aha moment. All right, so start. So is a closure a function that captures something from its outer context? Is that true? So is a, a closure a function that captures something from its outer context? That is true. So again, if we use the, uh, the idiomatic definition of what closure is, it's a function that captures something from the outside context. So if we go back, let me go back to this uh, Golang example. All right, so here I have a function. Uh, and because it's anonymous, I would not be able to call it unless I call it, you know, I, unless I call it already here, right? So if I, if I call it here, then I don't need this M, but if I just want to declare it and call it a little bit later, so if I want to call it here, then because this one is anonymous, then I would have to have some sort of way of referring to it. And I, now I have a, a way to refer to it and it's called M, right? So I can call it here. Um, but if this function has a name, right, uh, inner, let's say, then I don't need this M. I can call it, I can call it by the name. So I can call it inner, right? Clean, right? Um, you understand that. So now I have this function and I'm doing something inside this function. And let's say I have a variable, yeah, let's not mix uh, Golang with, uh, has, uh, with uh, Rust. So let's uh, say I have a variable, I have some X, okay? So I have some X, it's number 10. And then if I use X here, then my inner becomes a closure, right? If I don't use X here, it's just a inner function, right? It's not a closure because I'm not capturing anything like if I have my own uh, Y and I'm doing something with Y and whatever, right? If I, if I don't capture anything from my outside of me, then I'm not a closure. If I do, I'm a closure. Is that clear? Right, so if that's clear, it doesn't matter if it's anonymous or not, right? You, you get the, the idea. If I delete the name, it, it is still not a closure. Now it is a closure, right? Uh, not, not a closure closure. It doesn't matter whether, whether I have this name here or not, right? So those two concepts are independent of each other. You can have a language where you have closures, you have a language where you have anonymous functions, and then you have a language where you have closures and anonymous functions, right? Uh, you, you have, you know, all sorts of different combinations. In JavaScript, you can do all four. In Golang, you can do all four, right? Um, in Rust, Okay, so let's go to the final thing. So start the quiz. Start the quiz. So now uh, a question about Rust. Um, no, it's not a question about Rust. It's a question without a uh, question about Rust. So closure must be anonymous function, true or false? It's false, they don't, right? Uh, I just showed you that they don't. Um, all right, so having that in mind, uh, Rust has closures. And um, okay, so let's go to the leaderboard. Let's see how you guys doing. Yeah, we have one sort of uh, Ted Mosby uh, on the top. All right, so uh, let's go to the, where is it? So in, um, if I were to do this in, in Rust, 
I, I want to um, make a function which does something and it's inside another function. I cannot kind of do it like this. I have to rename that to fn. I have to say let x, I have to put a semicolon. I have, Jesus. And then uh, I cannot say fn here uh, with a name. Uh, I kind of need to have a closure. They, so, so, so it's called. So I have to say, okay, let m equal. And then um, instead of curly braces, you use a pipe symbol, right? So you use pipe symbol, and then you go on with your body of the function, right? So the syntax is not, again, it's not consistent. Like you're asking, why, why I cannot just say fn, you know, fn and round brackets. That would be so much more consistent, right? Uh, but you can't. Um, Again, I don't quite know, don't know why, uh, that annoys me too. Uh, so you do this. And then if you need to use X, uh, you kind of, um, you have access to the outside environment, uh, but you don't have to use it, right? So I have now a function which doesn't take any arguments. So here I have, if I put A or B or A and B, uh, I have two parameters to my M, right? So when I'm calling my M, uh, here, I can pass some parameters to it, right? Uh, if I don't have those, I don't have uh, arguments, uh, which is fine. And now this is just an anonymous function, but it is called closure in, in the language of Rust. And then if I use X here, like I do something with X, then it will be a closure, right? Uh, a proper closure, closure. But if I don't use it, it's just an anonymous function, but they will still call it a closure, right? Um, so the, the syntax is a little bit different. You don't have this semicolon uh, behind this block. And this becomes an expression which you can assign to something, right? Uh, so uh, you kind of get, you, you need to get used to it. Uh, the nice thing is that you don't need to specify, like if I say I'm taking A and um, returning A plus 10, right? So what, what, happening, what happens here is, Probably A is uh, I32, but I don't have to say it. And probably this closure um, or this function returns I32, but I don't have to say it neither. You can, but you don't have to, right? So you can kind of omit those two things, uh, the type annotations and the compiler will infer what, what those types are. Uh, but you can uh, specify them if, if, um, if you want to be on the safe side, right? If you want to enforce certain uh, type constraints, then you can kind of do that. And again, we don't need the return statement uh, and we don't put the semicolon here. Um, do you get it? Yeah, it, it is a little bit annoying, but it's still nice, right? It's a little bit nicer than, um, um, than what, like, it is kind of the same in C++, I would say. But yeah, anyway, it is okay. Um, so one final question. All right, so let's go to the uh, start quiz. Start quiz. All right, so in Rust, main functions cannot be closures. Um, yeah, that was kind of in, in implied. So you should be able to answer that. Um, yeah, and then the next one, in the rest, all anonymous functions are closures. Yeah, so, so here that's the kind of the, why? Uh, so basically it's true, uh, but it's not true at the same time, right? Um, it, it is like, the, it is called closure, but it's not a closure, right? Unnecessarily. It could be a closure, but it doesn't have to be, but it is still called closure, right? 
Uh, so why, like, uh, you know, I, I was like thinking, <laughs> the first time I, I learned about it, I was like, uh, why, right? Why, why um, what, what, yeah, what went wrong, right? Uh, why you just call it lambdas or whatever, right? And why do you think? Why all the fun in, uh, anonymous functions are not just anonymous functions, but they are kind of called closures. So they are not closures, like, uh, you know, really, like if you, uh, if you have this, uh, where is the, if I have this uh, M here, it is called closure. It, it is in Rust, it, this thing is called closure, but I'm not capturing anything from outside of my outer context. It's not a closure, it's just anonymous function, right? Um, it, it, it's just Lambda or anonymous function. It's not a closure, but it is called closure. So, but you, you know, why do we have that? Like, why do we care? What do you think? Well, um, the answer is, as with most weird things in uh, in Rust, uh, where is my yeah? So the answer is memory management, right? We need to take care of memory, and then if my inner function, my uh, lambda, captures something from outside, I need to know how it has been captured and what I'm doing with it, right? Do I capture it with ownership or do I? only capture it read only or how, how those things happen. So if I have kind of a, a inner function which doesn't take anything, then yes, that is kind of an inner function, but I still need to kind of be taking care of what I could have captured from the outside, right? Uh, so the memory management is kind of the, uh, the fundamental thing here that we do need to care about. And that's why even though we may have closures, which in fact are just anonymous functions, just in case we have to kind of try to check if they didn't capture anything, right? Uh, and that's why the default is that it's always closures, right? Uh, because we do need to ca care about the memory management. Uh, if we didn't care about the memory management, then we would call them uh, anonymous functions and then it would be like lambdas, like, like it would be like in Haskell. Um, so because of that, uh, you do need to pay attention like how this capturing happened. And if we didn't capture it, anything, that's just a special case, right? But it was still considered to be a closure uh, in the first place. Um, so that's the kind of the, the reason behind it. So um, it's a little bit weird, but it's kind of fine as well, right? Uh, you just remember that every time they say closure, they don't really mean closure, they mean Rust closure, right? Uh, it could have been just an anonymous function without being a closure. Um, a, a really nice thing that I really like about Haskell, and of course I, I really like about Haskell, uh, about Rust, and I really like about Haskell as well, is the algebraic data types, right? So Haskell has enums, and they are very similar to uh, algebraic data types in Haskell, um, where we can compose uh, a particular type out of particular things that it can be, right? So for example, maybe type, which is called option in, in, in Rust. So a maybe type can be of, um, um, of, of nothing, which is called none, or it can be an option of some value, right? And because you have generics, you can have this po uh, polymorphic value of, of any type, um, and then you can sort of use it. So it's, um, Let's see, <clears throat> with the options here, I had the, yeah, so here we have, um... <clears throat> we have uh, an option which has a value two, uh, and then it, you know, we're doing kind of a, a matching on, on the option and it's either something which has a value or nothing, right? Um, so it's exactly the same as with the maybes in, in Haskell. So if you got used to this sort of a notion of, uh, of maybes and uh, results um, eithers in, in Haskell, which is a result in, uh, in Rust, then you will kind of uh, find yourself uh, quite at home. 
So uh, the way you define it is you say it's an enum of certain types. So let's say we have um, a card or a car, and then you specify what what values it, it could have, like what value types it can become, right? So let's say I have um, a Toyota, uh, or I can have um, whatever, yeah, whatever else, uh, Subaru. And then um, it can be just like an enum, like uh, like a very primitive enum that is just a type, same as you have in, uh, for example, in Java, uh, that those, you know, um, a car can be either Toyota or Subaru, uh, and that's it. Uh, that's the end of the story. Or you can attach additional um, uh, context or content for a particle type. And you can say, um, yeah, car is not a very good one, let's say. Um, I'm not very creative. Um, let's say we have animals and then we have uh, a bird and then we have something to do with wings, wings um, and wings, let's say it's a string or something, right? Um, and then I have um, snake and snake doesn't have legs or um, anything. So I may have um, a dog, and then dog has legs, right? So I can have kind of um, I can have an animal now, which can be either bird, dog, or snake. And then if it's a bird or dog, it has a, a extra context. It has extra kind of value inside. Uh, you can have multiple uh, multiple values if you want. I think. Uh, or it can have uh, a type which doesn't have anything kind of um, inside, and it's just a it's just a, a value. And then you say animal, uh, and then you have kind of a snake or uh, animal, which is uh, a bird, right? And then you can do pattern matching on the particular type, same as we are doing here. Um, so we have an option, and we kind of a pattern match on on what type. Uh, which version of the type you actually got, right? Um, we will talk a little bit more about it uh, later on. So uh, that's the uh, that's the enums, and that's the end of the uh, of the start of the of the Haskell syntax. Um, so you know functions, you know how to declare variables, uh, you know that if you want something mutable, you have to call mute on it. So if I have, um, let's delete that. So if I have, um, yeah, so um, I have a function name, which is, uh, what it does, it uh, returns, yeah, so what I could do, I could return y, um, and then I can say uh, let x equals name 120, and then um, if I want to say that x equals x, x plus 1, that would not work because X is immutable, right? So if I want X to be mutable, I have to say <clears throat> it's mutable. Um, so you know that, uh, you know the, the normal types, you know how to do the structs. And then again, <clears throat> if we have a struct, let's say we have a struct, which is a student uh, and we do name, which is, um, string literal and age, which is uh, I32. Then I, I can say I have some implementations for student and I can declare um, I can declare some methods, same as in Golang, right? Um, in Golang, it, it would be kind of this, almost the same. Um, uh, so let's say I have um, age, so I have, H by one, 
and then um, I would take. So here I have to say that I'm taking the um, the instance of a student. So I would um, say I have. Um, and I don't take any arguments, and then I would um, make self dot h equals self dot h plus one, right? Uh, in Golang, you would do the same, but instead of doing the imp student, you would say I have a func which takes uh, s, which is a student. Uh, and then it's called h by one. Um, and then you would say s h plus one, right? Um, and then if you're taking the uh, reference of it, you would do this. Uh, so you'd say, I have a pointer to a student because I'm mut mutating it. If you do, did that, you would kind of uh, didn't, you, you wouldn't really, um, uh, mutated the original, you would kind of mutate the copy because you are passing by by value. Here we are passing by pointer, right? Uh, so the same as here, uh, but this uh, first argument is the of that type, uh, and then you can kind of refer to it uh, from within the body of the function. Um, so and then if you have multiple implementations, you you have another one here, right? So you specify all the functions which are operating on the student record in kind of that way. Um, so you have the uh, some kind of a basic fundamental things to to write basic code. Uh, you cannot. Um, so next uh, on Thursday, we will have a session where uh, Carl will talk about ownership and how you passing things by reference and how you passing things by value and what this ownership business kind of uh, is all about. Uh, but the, the kind of the fundamental syntax um, for the language you you, you sort of have. Uh, matching patterns and so on we will cover later, um, such that you don't need to, to have it for next uh, session. Um, what else do you need for Thursday? Yeah, this, this is... Um, um, so Rust is kind of an evolving language, a little bit like Haskell. So you have some compiler flags that allow you to access some of the features of the language that are uh, not by default enabled and also to control some of the flags for the compiler. So for example, this one uh, makes it, uh, makes the compiler not complaining about uh, unused variables, right? So if I have something if I say, uh, you know, let y and then I didn't use it, then normally the compiler will complain. If you don't want those complaints, you can put that in. It's, it's good not to put that in. It's good to see what you are not using and so on. You get a warning. It's not a compiler error, it's, a, it's just a warning. Um, all right, so I think that's, that's all. Do you have any questions for, for that part? I think it's pretty straightforward. There were no uh, really complex things here. Um, so let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about um, Haskell. So in, in Haskell, we kind of got to this, um, um, <clears throat> to the point, um, don't have, I cannot draw, uh, it's kind of a pity. So um, let me see. So I will wave my hands. Um, so um, <clears throat> every time you need to capture some state, you can use this kind of a monadic construct, right? So you have a monad, um, and then um, the monad allows you to capture a particular state um, within a um, uh, par particular context. So let's say I have some, uh, some function which um, operates on, on my board, right? Uh, so I can, I, I kind of gave this example before. So um, let's say make move and then make move takes a, a board and it takes, 
you know, some form of um, move, like uh, what do you want to, to do? Uh, and then it returns you the, it returns you the new board, right? Um, and that's a pure function. It kind of uh, takes the board, takes the move and returns you the, the board. And then when you're composing those functions, you kind of need to pass this board around, right? So what we can do is we can turn the board into a monad and then keep track of the particular state of, of, where, of what kind of has to do with the board such that we don't need to always pass it around. We just kind of a pass the move and then we have uh, sort of the, the context and something being kind of a passed within the context of the, of the monad itself. Um, if we do that, uh, and, and you can kind of do that, um, sometimes you need to have um, additional monad, which kind of uh, compose, like allows you to do the processing. Like you need to ask the user for something or you're doing something in a particular context, but you need to go to another monadic context to, for example, ask a user for input or to, op to, to do something else. Right, so then um, what happens is usually when, when you kind of step up of, out of your program and you kind of think globally on uh, what, what do you have, right? So you have a certain layers. So I can have a certain layer uh, and then I can say, um, this is my monadic context for IO and I need to uh, control um, the interactions with the user. But then you may say, yeah, but I also have kind of um, like, this is for, for the outside of my architecture of my program, but inside I might have this board, right? Which I'm kind of uh, do, doing something with it. Or even you may have some, uh, you, maybe you have some maybes uh, and then you have kind of um, a board, right? Um, so then you kind of end up with having a bit of a stack so you have a particular monadic context. Let, let's say, um, um, yeah. So let's say I you have uh, you 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 have this. You have um, uh, a maybe, which has inside a board, which kind of inside itself needs to talk to I/O. Right? You have. Um, Let's say you're doing some AI and you're saying, okay, give me some uh, possible moves. And then you get a maybe, maybe board or maybe move, but you may get nothing if there is like, if it's a game over, right? So you, you, on the outside layer, you have um, like the, the, the most uh, processing layer, you have maybe, and then the maybe can return you a board and the board inside has kind of an IO to, to ask a user for something, right? And if you chain those monads kind of one, inside another and inside another, then it's a lot of typing and a lot of like pattern matching of actually getting to the point where you can do something useful, right? Uh, and because of that, um, the, the Haskell language has something which is called monad transformers. And monad transformers, it's basically a mechanism for you to simplify those kind of dependencies of, of being having one monad embedded inside another one, right? Um, like the, you know, the, the simplest one may, maybe is like uh, one maybe uh, being inside another maybe, right? Um, and then you have your your final type. Let let's say you know eventually I get to a string, but I have like I'm reading a string. It can return me a string or not, and then I'm I'm doing something with it, and it can be uh, another string or not, and then I'm eventually getting to something to to to, to do. Um, so then, if if that's the case. If the case is that you have one monad inside another one, then you would like when you're programming, then you would have to have all this wiring like from one context to another and up again and so on done manually, right? And to avoid that, you can use what's called monad transformers. And monad transformers, it's uh, usually the same thing as the normal monad, but it has uh, kind of a T attached to it, right? And the T attached to it means that the context content of that maybe will be another monad. And then because the monad transformer know that the content of the in, inner thing is another monad, it knows how to do this kind of uh, traversals, right? So you can go down and you can go up and you can do certain things uh, in, a, in a simpler way, right? So uh, one of those um, 
transformer is maybe T. And then if maybe T takes an IO, uh, then you have additional things that allow you to kind of do the IO from within the context of your monad, right? That, does it make sense? I, it, it kind of probably feel a little bit um, abstract, but uh, you know, normally what, what happens is, you know, on the edge of your program, of your logic, you have to talk to the user, right? So you will have something to do with the IO monad. Uh, and then if you a little bit more pure, then maybe you, you're doing some maybes or maybe you have your board or maybe you're doing some, you know, um, so, so maybe T is a very useful one. Uh, you can check that out. Uh, state T is another very useful one. Uh, so it's same as a state monad, but it, it is used for the transformers. Um, what else? Of course, you have either uh, either T as well. Um, and then uh, if, if you're chaining that, instead of using maybe for something that has something to do with IO inside, you can use maybe T, and then you have additional machinery to kind of make your code a little bit easier because it knows how to um, how, how to bind the inner type uh, from within from within your context, right? So instead of using maybe an either uh, and then having an I/O somewhere inside, you can use maybe T and having the I/O inside, and then you will see that you have additional functions which allow you to do lifting and like lift I/O and and so on. So for example, you have a function called lift IO, and that allows you to call something that uses IO from within your maybe monad, right? You don't need to do this pattern matching and you don't need to go like extract the in inner thing in your context to be able to call it. You can kind of um, use those uh, functions which allow you to do it uh, directly, right? Um, so for the, for the final assignment, because we, um, uh, we, we're gonna keep track of certain contexts and we're gonna keep track of some dictionaries or, 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 or some things. Uh, those, those transformers might come handy. You don't need to use them. You can kind of co code it in a, in a traditional kind of like uh, using maybe and state. You, you can even try to do it without a state. Um, but if you try to do that without a state, then you have to pass the um, you know the, the current context around all the time, and that becomes a little bit uh, cumbersome. Um, so I, I I wrote the the assignment without the state, and then I rewrote it with state, and it's nicer. But it's still it's not as nice as if you rewrite it with state t, right? So you can uh, start with what you already know. If you're kind of comfortable with maybes and either's, you can just use them for error handling and for managing the context. Uh, but if you want the program to be a little bit uh, more compact and more um, better structured, you can go to the state monad. And then once you start using the state monad and you need some something kind of inside which is IO, then you, you can use state with the IO being inside, right? Uh, and then you will see that it, it's actually the nicest way of, of dealing with this. Um, and it's not that hard. Like once you start using state, for example, uh, then then uh, 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 converting your code to the transformers, it's um, it's it's um, it's relatively easy. Um, so you 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 can see that the transformers um, work in in pairs, right? So you always have the outer outer monad and the inner monad, uh, and the and it's kind of like a pair. So if you need more layers than two, uh, then you need to chain multiple transformers, right? Always the in, inside one, the, the inner, the most inner one can be just a normal uh, monad uh, and the, the outer ones and the outer ones, then that's where the uh, benefits of transformers come, um, come into play. Um, so in terms of architecture, yes, uh, we, um, you often kind of have uh, have a picture where you have um, some intermediate stage, and then you have um, your kind of a business logic kind of in the core, right? So we have um, when we organizing your when when you organize your program, your like 
from the very abstract way of looking at it. Uh, you group things into what are the, the most pure, like um, domain specific things that the business logic, and then how it interacts with the components or with the outside things. And then eventually how it interacts with the IO and with the outside world, right? Um, so you have kind of a modular architecture where you start with defining your domain uh, and then just the, um, just the logic for the, uh, for the domain itself. And you don't care like where the data comes from and where the data goes to, it's just kind of the, the inner logic, right? And that inner logic is the most pure. And then as you go to the edge, uh, that's where you kind of uh, have those, um, the need for, you know, IO monad or some, uh, some transformers. In that level, like here, usually you kind of very pure. Uh, you have your own data types that you defined and you operate on them and you, um, you know, it's easy to test. Uh, you can mock things, you can use the, uh, the quick check and so on. And as you move out to the, to, the, to the edges, like for example, here, it becomes more cumbersome because you already have some context, you already have multiple things interacting. And then at that level, it's, it, it is kind of the hardest, right? So we usually don't test, uh, usually no testing here, right? Um, if you're already reading and, and uh, interacting with the user, uh, usually you uh, don't really test uh, the IO itself. You're testing kind of uh, the, whether the logic is, is done correctly. Uh, I don't know if, if, yeah, that kind of helps you, but um, the bottom line is um, if you're using uh, maybes and eithers for error handling, Okay, that's great. Uh, check state. So state is not for error handling. State is for handling a state inside your program. So you uh, you can kind of um, lock things, or you can keep track of the of the errors, like accumulate them. Uh, you you can kind of um, or organize your program into something that operates on the on the state. Uh, and once you do that, then consider using a state t or uh, maybe t, and then either t. Um, and those will kind of help you to uh, make the program a little bit more modular and a little bit nicer to, to program in. Um, I will finish the, uh, the extended calculator and um, like specify the requirements for the, for the language that we want to play with. Uh, but yeah, I kind of ran out of time over the weekend and couldn't do it. Yep. Okay, so any questions? So the Thursday sessions will be online because Carl is in Oslo and he will not be traveling. So the sessions which say uh, Carl in them, uh, they will be run in uh, remote settings. Uh, and the, uh, my sessions will be run here. So there was an announcement from the rector today, which was suggesting that we should move back to campus. And in Jovig, we have the allowance for groups of 100 students to be organized together. And then for classes, I, I think it's just limited by the room capacity. Like, um, so, you know, university is allowed to do some gathering, some events which have up to 100 students. Uh, and then for teaching, yeah, we are encouraged to, to move it on, uh, to the to campus. So we will continue here um, when I have a session. And then uh, for Carl, it will be uh, remote. All right, so that's almost all. I just checked the questions. Um, let me see. Yeah, so what we will use Rust for? Um, that is a good question. Uh, you can use the Rust for whatever you want, right? So we had students last year uh, using some uh, Rust for the cloud assignment. So instead of doing it in Golang, they've done it in Rust. Uh, to learn more about Rust. Um, you can do that. Uh, it's a little bit harder. So Golang is easier and Golang will be faster and you will be more productive um, in, in terms of like speed to effect, right? Um, but if, you, uh, if you're programming kind of low level things, if you really require uh, manual memory management, if you require like a top level performance, uh, 
then Rust is a good choice. Like if you have uh, some large data set to process or if you generating some sort of experiment and you really need performance, yeah, it, it will be more memory efficient and, and faster. Um, if you compare your typical use cases, like for example, this student um, use case that we had like initialize some students and do some parsing of the, like remember the exercise with new, uh, if you do that in Rust and if you do that in Haskell or Golang, the actual raw performance will be very comparable. You, you will not see uh, huge differences. Uh, Rust might be a little bit faster. Uh, we did some tests like a year ago and two years ago. And uh, in some tests, Rust was a little bit faster and some tests Golang was a little bit faster. Um, Rust typically is more memory efficient. So the memory footprint usually is better for Rust. But you know those are very unique things like you should never optimize for performance un unless you really need it, right? Uh, so I know from past experiences that uh, students who are exposed to Golang, um, they liked it and they used it for their bachelor projects for backend side, uh, whatever they were doing, usually they used Golang for the backend. Some used PHP, but most use Golang. Um, you now know Haskell and you know um, Rust, so, you can use whatever you feel fits best for your case, use case. Um, yeah. I use it for writing stuff that I really want to squeeze the most out of the um, machine, right? So if I have some experiments and I have to generate large amount of data and then I need to process it, I would do it in Rust. Uh, but if I have a very complex logic, and I really need to get the logic right, I will usually do it first in Rust, uh, in Haskell or in Golang. And then if it doesn't uh, perform, uh, like if I no, uh, notice some bottlenecks, I will rewrite it in Rust, right? So I usually don't start with Rust. I end up with Rust if I need it, but I usually start with something else. Uh, I, I am not as efficient in Rust. I, I need to think more and uh, it's slower. Like it takes me long, longer time to, to finish it. Uh, so I prefer to prototype things in, um, in other languages like in Haskell or in Golang. Um, for prototyping, yeah, I mostly use Golang. It's, it's, um, I, I am like the fastest. Um, yeah, but it, it may be different for you. So pick whatever feels yeah, best for you. Yeah, so I I am not like uh, entirely convinced that Rust benefits are really outweighing the modern C++ with all the tooling and features. And some people from C++ community say we have all the same checks and we have all the same benefits, uh, which I'm not as deep into it to, to, to say, yes, these guys are right or these guys are right. They, they, I, I think both are right, right? So. Um, I think if you're careful and if you're using the modern C++ features and you do more uh, modern idiomatic way of C++, then I don't think Rust has benefits. I, I think it's kind of the same, yeah. Um, I do like the enumerative types, these algebraic types in Rust. So C++ doesn't have it and C++ doesn't have a tradition of using them, right? So for example, some of the collection mechanisms, some of the API for collections in Rust are much nicer because they have this functional feel. You have all the, you know, uh, maps and filters and all those things natively in the in the collection library, right? Whereas in C++, you sort of have it as well, but it feels a bit add-on, and um, it's not as nice, right? Um, some syntax they, they I, I don't really like neither the C++ syntax or the Rust syntax. They uh, you have to type a lot. Um, so they are comparable, I would say. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I was a little bit discouraged with C++ uh, a couple of years ago, like maybe six, seven years ago, um, because it was a bit of a mess. But now it, it is quite nice. I mean, the modern C++ feels really, really nice. Um, yeah. From, from 17, from 17 upwards, yeah. Yeah, I 
yeah, it depends on your background and depends uh, like how much time you spend in a language as well. Then you will be the, the most efficient. Like I am most efficient in, in Go, uh, but then again, I spent most time in Go. Uh, Haskell, yeah, I need to think a little bit, but then I know I got it right. Um, and I'm quite happy uh, and I know it's easy to maintain it and to, to extend it and so on. Uh, with Rust, I only did like two, two, two smallish projects. Uh, so I'm not as, you know, entrenched yet. Um, and in, in C++, I was doing a lot of C++ like, you know, 10 years ago and then I kind of drifted off. So I'm not as good in the modern C++, uh, but I, I like it. Yeah, it's, it's okay. It's quite verbose. Once you get used to those high level languages uh, where you don't have to type so much, it kind of starts to annoy you that you have to type so much. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and as I said, most of the time, if you're doing some crude application or web application, the raw performance is not really the problem. The dealing with the complexity is the problem. So um, then if you choose something like Rust or C++, you have a lot of extra work. For the benefit, of course, you will be able to handle more transactions per second or requests per second, but most of the time you don't need it. Like uh, it's the, the functionality and the logic that is you know, the, the fundamental thing. And then it's easier to do it in a language that helps you. Um, so I would suggest, yeah, you start with something that you can do something quickly and then you re re redo it if you need to, right? Um, we did, like, it, you should never optimize for performance to start with. That, that's a waste of time. Uh, you should do it and then measure it and see what is the slowest part, where, where you have a bottleneck. And then you need to optimize for that. Um, planning to optimize or coding some kind of hacks for performance, that's always a waste of time. Uh, you need to measure it. So that's that's what I've learned. I mean, I, I was always like, yeah, let's pick the fastest language and, and so on, you know. But I learned that that is not how it works. Um, even if you're trying to be efficient and, you know, do stuff fast, it will turn out you're doing it wrong anyway. You, you have to do it, you know, differently. Um, so, yeah. All right. Um, I will stop.